Why capitalism triumphs in the West and fails everywhere else? The Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto presents several arguments suggesting that dead capital sitting in land through registration can be made available and help promote wealth accumulation for the individual. A study by Galliani and Sargrosky have found that families with titles substantially increased their housing investment, reduced household size, and improved the education of their children. Critique has been raised from several researchers that De Soto's argument represents an idolized view where release based capital more likely ends up in the hands of the existing elite. The challenge is us to make this dead capital available for the individual landholders and occupants. What previously had been a Herculean task can today be accomplished by adopting agile land management approaches fused with geospatial information technologies to help access and release dead capital. But is capital and wealth tied to land? One indicator is to look at the distribution of assets defining existing wealth. In 2021, 49.8% of all wealth in the world was tied to commercial, agricultural, and residential real estate. The graph speaks to the distribution of registered real estate only. Having an, <clears throat> having an additional registration of land would create a significant increase in wealth of real estate as only 30 to 40% of the world's real estate associated to land has been registered. To De Soto's point, there is a significant amount of debt capital in the world not entering and driving the world economy forward. To understand where and how to possibly release this, let us take a closer look at some of its mechanism. The diagram represents a simple model to illustrate the release of debt capital <clears throat> and accumulation of wealth from land. If land is debt capital, it can either be taken or sold, where the proceeds are paid directly to the owner with only insignificant contribution to the national economy. If land gets registered, it can receive an equitable public valuation from which the owner establishes a collateral against which a loan can be granting, allowing the owner to reinvest and increase capital gains in the land or acquire new land. Once registered and valued, land can get taxed, and from this, government can generate revenue. To promote and collect taxations, governments will need to reinvest, like providing services and infrastructure, hereby increasing the value of land. From this, or through owner improvement, equity in land increases, allowing owners to reinvest or getting capital gains from sale, through which government can generate revenue from fees, capital gain taxes, or increased consumption on taxable goods. But to start this wealth accumulation engine, registration, valuation, and government planning and development for the common good is an absolute necessity. It is in these three areas that geospatial information technology can provide short, medium, and long-term support. Firstly, the reality is that many tenure systems often are present within a country and aiming for only one formal tenure system will take extensive resources and time and most likely fail. So to release that capital in these systems, a different approach is required. One option is to adopt a continuum of rights where the different tenure systems are represented as a continuum from informal to formal land rights. In this structure, any tenure type can coexist and be recorded, geometrically represented and geocoded. As need arises, informal recognized tenures can be further formalized by moving them to the right in the continuum of right diagram through a set of legally established procedures. The ISO 19 154 land administration domain model represents such an approach. It can be fully accommodated within the geospatial information technology and support different tenure types in the same data scheme. Informal tenure descriptions can coexist with high precision measurement networks. 
For any jurisdiction, LADM can be adopted to support existing standards while at the same time providing options to, in, to expand informal tenure representations. One specific challenge with the release of capital is the inefficiency of tenure transactions in many countries. Over the last decade, Fit for Purpose or FFP represents a more pragmatic approach with owner and government participation, allowing for quick boundary demarcations, agreement between parties and issuance of proof of tenure. So for example, in Colombia, following the civil conflict and as a part of the peace accord, there was a need to establish official recognition of millions of smaller agricultural plots. To, port, to support this particular registration, a cloud-based geospatial infrastructure was established to allow for an FFP approach, as more formal methods would take an estimated century to accomplish. Using, using aerial imagery, uh, plot boundaries and centroids were manually identified, after which owners and government surveyors in the field agreed to, to the boundaries. These were then captured real time by the owners using mobile devices and DNSS receivers. Through public hearings, consensus on final boundaries were reached between owners from evaluation of boundary maps, imagery, and other GIS base map data. Following agreement, titles initially were issued to landholders. Many countries like Nigeria and Kenya have provisions in the legislations and survey manual survey manuals to adopt such an approach. But initial manual capture of usage boundaries can be time consuming. Within the last three to four years, advancement in machine and deep learning, um, you know, GIS today enables uh, automated boundary extraction of features like roads, buildings, and usage boundaries from imagery. Once a model has been trained, it can literally extract hundreds of thousands of features in a few hours compared to weeks and months of manual digitization. As can be seen in the movie, initial usage boundaries have been identified and automatically extracted, providing a good foundation for initial plot identification. Secondly, value of land is required for governments where revenue from, from land is driven from either land transactions like in Dubai or land taxations like most European countries. Similarly for landowners to invest, value of land is required to document equity and establish a collateral. Where land registration value and taxation never have been implemented, estimating land value represents a challenge. The example here is from Kigali in Rwanda, where there was a need to predict market values based on housing plot characteristics against market values to, de to determine equitable property taxation. Using geospatial information technology, base data was firstly prepared with demarcations of buildings, identification of roads, infrastructure, and building properties obtained from field surveys. Known Known sales data was then collected for a representative sample of the property population and a statistical model was trained to determine influence of these property characteristics on the sales value. These property characteristics, characteristics were then ranked according to their influence on sales value and a prediction model was generated. <clears throat> and lastly, the prediction model was then applied to estimate and visualize the sales values for each building in the entire population, the entire city. From the estimated market values, level of taxations could then be generated and the real estate market could be uh, regulated. Thirdly, to promote public incentive participation in first registration and pay taxes, governments will need to show value by investing back in the society. This is an absolute requirement. So these eight di diagrams shows part of land use planning conducted, conducted to either rebuild or re relocate Suma City in Japan 
which was destroyed by the 2011 tsunami. The question for the government was what and where, and where to reinvest. Using GIS, a set of investment indicators were identified and their attraction to reinvestment and development were mapped out. These maps were derived from planning analysis, field examination, public hearings, spatial analysis, modeling, historical data, and so on. For different indicators, sorry, for different indicator areas with red represents the lowest attraction to uh, investment and green the highest. The greener allocation is in eight maps combined, the higher the likelihood for capital gains from the land. Having, the indicate, having these indicator maps, also termed suitability maps, allowed the government to assess the impact or rather attraction of different planning propositions. In this case, it was eventually decided to rebuild Summa City in, exis in, in its existing location due to the importance of ancestry, being the plan you see on the right. Using GIS to assess planning scenarios, their impact for land values can quickly be verified against a set of indicators to assess financial benefits of proposed developments and communicate this to both citizens and potential investors. To help release debt capital and bring this into a national economy, it has briefly been argued here that geospatial information technologies can enable initial registration of tenure, support valuation of land for taxation and land market, and allow planning authorities to run what-if scenarios or proposed changes to estimate and communicate impact on economic development. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you everyone for listening in. I would like to uh, welcome Vincent Imala, who is uh, part of uh, assisting on the moderation to take uh, through the next session. Now, please take note that we, our session delayed by, I think it was almost 20, was it 20, 30 minutes. So we ask for your patience as we go to the next section. We are also mindful of time. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Desa, for your good moderation. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, our presenters. Uh, maybe, first of all, just give them a applaud of hand for their good presentation. So, I'll uh, briefly just uh, uh, summarize that we had uh, six presentations. The first one was given by Dr. Obeke from Digital Earth Africa. Uh, it was on uh, empowering national agencies with the information on agriculture, uh, mainly actually trying to see the kind of institutions that uh, can uh, leverage on the inf this agricultural information. We also had uh, a second uh, presentation by Jul uh, Julius Bengo from RCMRD, which was an open source framework for crop type mapping, uh, of course, uh, also using uh, digital Earth Africa uh, data. And uh, mainly also trying to look at uh, the kind of uh, crop types uh, in the selected regions, uh, also is trying to estimate the area of crop. Then uh, the third presentation was by Madam Lauren Enns uh, on the geospatial approach to enhancing food security, and of course also trying to look at how we can increase the production from that approach, and uh, also looking at the 2050 landscape, uh, agricultural landscape. And what was also what was also interesting was, uh, of course, uh, the application of uh, object-based uh, classification that actually is good for uh, boundary detection when you're doing a uh, crop type mapping. Then uh, we also had uh, the fourth presentation from Abigail, uh, that's from Israel, uh, using machine learning and GIS modeling in predicting how climate change can impact on global wood stability and food security, uh, of course using the ArcGIS Pro uh, software. Then uh, we also had the fifth presentation from uh, Madam Chinenje uh, Chioma from uh, Mofor Ozim College in uh, Nigeria, uh, looking at the assessment of vegetation laws in Ambra East local government in Nigeria, where she mainly applied the uh, Landsat data at the 30 meter resolution, downloaded from the uh, USGS uh, site, looking at the trend in uh, vegetation from 1986 to 2020. 
Uh, I want to thank you all for that. And before I open the floor for questions, I'd like to inform you that uh, there's a list that is circulating for participants, uh, which is going around. Make sure that you indicate your uh, contacts and the email address, because one of the objectives of this uh, plenary discussion is for us to have uh, a working group on this thematic area. So please make sure that you give us your details. As I open the floor for questions, uh, I'll be a bit strict with time, because uh, we started late. So we have uh, one question from each uh, column. These are one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you'll be given uh, four minutes uh, to ask your questions. And then, uh, of course, uh, the presenters will uh, react afterwards. So can I, sh by show of hand, uh, from that side? No question? OK. The second one. Is it too cold? Uh, <laughs> OK, I can see there's a hand that side. OK. Uh, three. Uh, OK, we'll start with them. Uh, please, uh, Steve, can you please hold the microphone for the first question? Thank you. Thank you to the panel and uh, the array of interesting presenters. I have a brief question to Abigail on the modeling work. I think uh, it's interesting to see us being able to visualize the future from where we sit. If you could comment briefly, uh, sometimes Magzent has been said to be over generous with um, its accuracies and how it treats uh, data. If you could just comment on if there are any plans to look at an ensemble way of doing the modeling or considering other machine learning uh, options. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Dolphin, and I have a question to you to Abigail. So first of all, thank you for that presentation. It was quite insightful. And I loved, in particular, the way you are considering other factors, uh, apart from, you know, just climate. And um, what are some of the weaknesses that you would consider the model had in terms of the prediction? And then on number two, to what extent can we use the same model to maybe try to figure out uh, suitability in terms of other factors like, for example, the soil carbon content, uh, maybe uh, carbon sequestration from plantations and all that. Thank you. Next question, so that we can easily take three first. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Japheth a PhD student from the University of Nairobi. I just have a concern. And also, first of all, I would like to thank you for the good presentation. Um, we have lots of data from private sector that is uh, maybe underutilized. And we have very few data from public sector which is overutilized. Uh, from the presentation by Julius, you've said we lack a proper framework on how to use this data set. Is there a collaboration, maybe a collaboration should now be made between private and the public sector? For example, if someone is doing a research in, from a university, maybe you need to consider being a co-author so that you have a very compact paper from your data sets and also through such collaboration. Because you see, if we have these lots of data and we are underutilizing them, it cannot help in any agency in even making decision. So I would like to request uh, maybe for a collaboration uh, between you and the student or you and the uh, 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 schools or the universities so that we have good paper that can help so that you meet the objectives of the data set that you collected. Reason being, uh, if we're using the machine learning, we must have lots of data for you to train it. If I go to an irrigation scheme, for example, my said I'm, I usually go to irrigation scheme, in a scheme I can collect maybe 100 data sets. 
it's very difficult to use machine learning in making decisions from such. So is there a platform for us to col collaborate? And even you be a co-author of our papers, because at this level now we publish papers. Thank you. OK, thank you for the first three questions. I think I uh, welcome uh, the presenters to react. Starting the topic again, please, welcome. Thank you all for your questions. I'll take the first one first. Um, yes, so there are a variety of methods to model things like, well, a species distribution in general, crop distribution more specifically. There are kind of two categories when it comes to machine learning. There's correlative machine learning, which is what this was. That's establishing correlation between species presence and environmental factors. And then there's something called mechanistic machine learning, which is basically when you tell the model that Corn, for example, grows really well between like 27 and 30 degrees Celsius. And then the model takes that information that you explicitly gave it and then makes predictions from that. So the problem with mechanistic machine learning is that you have to be able to have all of that data to give the model. Like, so you have to really have a firm understanding of the exact mechanisms that drive species, species suitability. And when you're looking at a large scale, like we did this for the entire world, it's really hard to get that kind of data that's, you know, can be applied everywhere. You can do it for smaller areas when it's a more controlled setting and you can get a really good handle on the environmental conditions and how they impact suitability. But for the entire world, that's not as feasible. And then within correlative again, MaxSense is one of the premier methods for doing this. But another one is something called random forest, which is again, a way to look at correlation between species presence and environmental conditions, but through a slightly different kind of method of doing that. Um, basically doing a bunch of classifications, picking the majority class, moving forward, et cetera. Um, I actually just published a paper on comparisons between MaxN and, and random forest talking about the benefits and drawbacks of each one. So if you're interested in reading, I'd be happy to share it with you. Uh, one thing I will mention with Random Forest and one of its main drawbacks is that it can tend to overfit the data. So for example, that means it will too much try to actually match the patterns that you give it, which means that it will miss out on a lot of suitable areas that just don't happen to be growing that crop for whatever reason. Maybe there's like a city there, maybe there's like a protected forest. Um, so it doesn't do a very good job of extrapolating out. Of course, Maxent is better at doing those extrapolations. Um, of course, the drawback there is that you may overclassify suitability, which is what you pointed out. But again, all models have their flaws, um, but with kind of these methods of evaluating them, there are definitely ways you can pick the best one for whatever situation. All right, and the next question from the side of the room was about the drawbacks in this method. And if I had to kind of pick one major drawback of this type of methodology, it's definitely the availability of data. So the NASA data that I used in this was um, all derived from remote sensing. So this is all using supervised classification to basically take satellite imagery, figure out what crops are growing where, but the problem with that, of course, is that it's not as well ground truth. And of course, like really great data is the ones where you can actually have someone verify on the ground, say this crop is actually growing there. So it's kind of a trade off between wanting to do this really large scale type of analysis and wanting to get really accurate data. But of course, your analysis is only as good as the data you feed it to begin with. So there are always and definitely lots of improvements to be made in terms of finding that type of data, storing that data on crop presence. And we actually had a presentation about that just now even. So there's a lot of great work being done there, um, which I'm happy to see. And your second question was, oh my gosh. Do you mind repeating it actually? I'm sorry. Uh, it was to what extent can we use the similar oh. method in other applications? Yes, yes. Um, great question. And I, yes, it's this type of species distribution modeling is something that can be applied pretty broadly. A lot of species distribution modeling is used to monitor endangered species. So say you operate a national park and it, that, in that national park, there's some kind of endangered, you don't know, bird or something like that. You can take locations where you've actually seen that bird, observed it in the wild, and then you can extrapolate and basically predict its entire range and get a better sense of where its protected areas should be, what areas of land need to be conserved. 
Um, in terms of your question about um, whether it can be applied outside of species distribution modeling, so whether you can take MaxEnt and look at kind of different types of land classification, land use, things like that. Um, I haven't specifically looked into that. My hunch would be probably, but these models are really best suited for species distribution. But again, there are tons of different models that look at these types of classification systems, and all of them have their trade-offs and um, their benefits as well. So I'm sure that there's a lot of different applications for that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. I think the, look, the second question was addressed to Julius. I don't know Thank you very much for your question uh, with regard to uh, collaboration between the private and the, and the public sector. Now, within RCMRD, we are open to partnerships and uh, we are working with a number of uh, 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 higher learning institutions in order to enhance research. And uh, we provide a lot of information, we provide data, provide uh, workflows, we have models that are running. So we are free to, we are open to partnerships with whoever is interested. Now within the Digital Art uh, Africa program, uh, Dr. Ken Mube will tell you that we are also open to working uh, with the interested parties to make sure that we develop a lot of use cases. Remember what, what I was presenting here was just a use case that we generated for uh, Zambia and we are looking forward into scaling up uh, into the entire country. We're also working it on it in, in Niger, uh, trying to also see how we can uh, scale this one up to the entire country. So generally, we are open. We want to build this open, uh, these these uh, use cases across Africa. Please, uh, you're welcome. Uh, we're open to working with the, anyone willing to come on board. Thank you. So I think thank you very much. I think. Uh, we will allow also the, another round of questions. Uh, from this side again, let me give you an opportunity. There was one here that... Uh, okay, oh, okay, fine, okay, proceed. Okay, thank you very much, I'm Clive. I represent media, I'm a media personality. My question is, the human population seems to be growing. It's growing exponentially. We, as humans, it seems like we've defeated death, we've defeated disease, and the population is rising. And we are taking the space of animals now that the population is rising. And the habitat loss is actually also linked to climate change. So my question is, with the increase in population and the need to protect biodiversity, what solutions can you actually provide? Or what, 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 Perhaps interventions can be made to actually also protect the environment and the biodiversity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the question is addressed to all the presenters. Maybe uh, uh, Lorraine, can you maybe attend to that? Okay. Yeah, that's a very key question. So the question was in relation to what can we do to help make the world a better place basically right at the end of the day um and i think i mean i think it comes down to people to be honest because the data is there and the technology is there and it's the capacity building and the understanding of how you combine the two to actually create actionable information but also for the people then to actually listen to that actionable information and implement it and i think that's where we still see quite a big gap because we've seen a lot of modeling we know that the crop type mapping is, is happening um, but who is, who is going to do it and who is going to be staying on top of it and, and who's going to, to help then put those interventions in place. And I think that's also, especially when it comes to agriculture, it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration between the government and the farmers. And it needs to be a two way street because, you know, we want to have more data from the farmers to do more accurate predictions, but the farmers need in return, they need to be able to be supplied with fertilizer mainly, right? With improved seeds to be able to, to, to grow the crops that they need to grow and feed us for the future. So I think it's, um, I mean, there is no, there is no clear answer, but I think it's, it, it's also a mindset and it's the people uh, that need to be willing to actually help and get this done. And the capacity that is needed within um, government, the capacity that's needed within the private sector to be able to 
keep running those models and to, to help people actually implement um, the solutions that we, we already have, I feel. So I think, I'm not sure that answers the question, but I think it's at the end of the day, it's down to you know, the people to make that decision and that change. Is there any, anybody else on the panel who wants to jump in as well? Ken? I think Lauren has actually answered all the question. Mine was to thank the person who asked the question, but because the person is coming from the media. So it means uh, with Earth Observation, it's, we are leaving no one behind. We are bringing the policy makers, we are bringing the experts here, we are bringing the media so that we can actually present our results in a way that they can actually help us. So actually looking even a uh, recent story with the National Media Group, they are training the journalists to be part of the conference of party climate change in Egypt in November. So it means we also have to present our results, which can be uh, well taken by the journalists who will actually educate the people to take the policies and to be part of one, uh, like we have the big four agenda for the country, we have sustainable development goals, and lastly, we have the African Union agenda 2063, so that we have the Africa we want. So your presence here is very important, and also thanking you thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Mtumbe. Uh, maybe just before we take uh, the last round of uh, questions, I also have uh, two, two questions. One to Lorraine, uh, particularly on uh, uh, the two approaches of uh, satellite image classification, the object-oriented classification, and uh, of course, we have also the pixel-based classification. And then, of course, uh, when you're using the object-oriented, uh, you are trying to address the issue of uh, uh, thin boundaries so that you can determine them accurately. Uh, uh, at what level is it accurate to uh, compare to pixel, the best classification? Then the other question is uh, to Madam Chinenje uh, on assessment of vegetation laws in uh, Anambra, East Local Government. Uh, I know the use of uh, large satellite imagery, of course, uh, there is the issue of uh, uh, resolution, spatial resolution with 30 meters, which is quite a big challenge. And uh, also, did you consider the issue of uh, seasonality, the temporal resolution of the image, because uh, when you talk of vegetation laws, we are also looking at uh, the seasonality. Maybe if you're using images of uh, a wet season, then of course it can give you misleading uh, information. Thank you. I can be quite brief on that one. Yeah, yeah, do you want to come up and take that question? Uh, it's a very technical question. It's about the two different models and the way to use it. So the pixel classification is literally just looking at, you know, is this pixel a road or is it not a road? Is it a vegetation or is it not a vegetation? So in combination with with that and, and knowing where vegetation actually is, you can then decide which of the pixels is actually vegetation and which is not. And therefore it is the boundary, whether the boundary is a road or a fence or something else. Uh, the other method is the object is more like object object detection, right? So utilizing a machine learning model to actually identify what is normally the shape of an object, uh, at teaching at that, um, and teaching a model how to identify that object and doing it from that angle. So those are the two different um, methods that you can use. But there's there's actually I'm pretty sure there's others as well where you can use combinations of both. Um, you know, it's it's a field that is um, is still growing, and there's there's a lot of models out there. So I think the data scientists in this room are probably the better people to answer these questions. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, there's there's various different models that can be used. Um, it was asking if we considered uh, the seasons in Nigeria before we actually run our analysis. The answer is, uh, we don't really consider the season, actually. But the years, plus or minus 70 years, was intentionally used because it's it's a very, like, it has a very big, like, from 1980 to 2023 is a very huge uh, space for us to conduct it. But uh, what we did was, because it's on vegetation loss, and because we are interested in how urbanization is affecting vegetation. So we do not put into consideration the seasons because what we are interested in is how uh, the uh, the government or the people who are into housing uh, is actually building or concentrating and making sure that uh, the rural area of the place has been extended because of urbanization, like I said, is the process through which uh, 
rural areas are being transformed into urban areas. So we're not putting into consideration the season because we are looking into vegetation loss due to urbanization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your reflection. Uh, Reverend Benson, if you could give just uh, the last question. Oh, okay. Maybe let me start with the uh, Silas from uh, DSRS. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Silas from DRSRS, but uh, I want to ask this question as a farmer back in Western. Um, to all the panelists, I think uh, we've had uh, uh, just us talking about uh, crop monitor, which I believe it's uh, giving accurate uh, uh, data. And then uh, just combining with all the panelists, um, there's an assessment that uh, we are using, or the models that we are using, just to uh, monitor the crop phenology. So I believe with all these models, we are able to give yield or even estimate the yields at the end of the day. So my question is, uh, are we able then to give uh, this data to insurance company so that we can uh, cushion the farmers, especially the large scale farmers uh, in this uh, uh, food basket that we have in the country to use just that data so that in case we have crop failure as we've witnessed even in the previous presentation that my colleague Vincent uh, gave on a, a crop forecast are we able to use this model to give to uh, insurance companies or this microfinance institution uh, to enable uh, farmers be cushioned uh, uh, in case there's an occasion of uh, uh, yield losses thank you uh, thank you, Zoe. Next time, maybe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you because of this opportunity. Uh, uh, actually, I've insisted a lot to give a question, and uh, here it is. Now, uh, you can say your name, please. My name is Jacqueline. Uh, Abigail, you are coming for, um, coming to you again. And uh, uh, we've heard about uh, so many programs of uh, geoengineering uh, concerning the climate change of the future. and. Uh, this is, also, this is an initiative that is ongoing and uh, it, it attempts actually to mitigate on, these, uh, on, uh, on the issues of the climate change. Now concerning uh, your presentation, you actually base it on the best scenarios. And uh, I, I'm actually, I'm thinking about the other uh, extreme end of the best scenario, the, the best scenario uh, from the, 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 the worst scenario. Now, uh, concerning the representative concentration pathways uh, of the future climate, now, uh, do you think that uh, we also need to, in as much as we, we emphasize on the w worst scenarios, and uh, that w most of the climate, uh, the, the climate change scientists uh, and researchers in general, they, they emphasize much on the, the worst case scenarios. Now, also, uh, regarding that, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that also we need th th that optimistic, optimistic uh, uh, perspective. Uh, my question actually is, did you also uh, consider the other representative concentration pathway uh, on the other extent, the, the best case scenario? Thank you. Okay, okay next. The last one, please. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. That was, I think the, the first question from Silas, maybe if uh, just to explain, I think it is uh, actually addressed to Abigail and Lorin. And basically, it talks about um, crop insurance, uh, what precautionary measures are put in place, and also uh, what uh, uh, facilitation, the information you will have to farmers in case of uh, crop failure. I think uh, one of uh, we can address that. Yes. Yeah. The last sentence. What the influence was of? So it's it's about insurance, right? So, yes. so insurance is usually important, especially for farmers, and it makes them more 
less averse to risk, so they might actually be more willing to change seeds or to change crop types because if they know they're insured, then they know that they're going to get some money back in, in case something fails. So it's hugely important. And the insurers themselves should actually be using a lot of GIS to actually help you know, reduce their risk by insuring the farmers because they can actually look at satellite imagery, right? They can actually do uh, earth observation and they can actually see where the fields are that they're insuring. Are they close to a river? Is there any flood risk? So they can do their own classification and create their own suitability models to look at you know, where's the field located? Where's what's the flood risk? What's the, um, you know, what's the heat risk? What's the what's the weather been doing in that location in the last few years to actually assess those risks to therefore make sure that they provide the right kind of insurance to the farmers. So it's it's hugely important, and and insurance and GIS really go hand in hand, and it's a big business in some parts of the world, uh, and especially for for housing market and housing insurance. Um, you know, looking at, at flood zones, looking at fires, looking at risky areas for natural hazards, earthquakes, etc. So absolutely, it's, it's hugely important and I really do hope that uh, insurance companies um, are, are utilizing those tools to act, and, and they're available, right? The, the data is available, the tools are available. It's a matter of uh, the insurance companies actually making use of those tools to then help de-risk uh, certain farmers or certain areas so that they could actually help the farmers with the, with the right insurance and it, make, it will make a huge impact, I think, for the farmers in the end. Yeah. Uh, just allow me to chime in. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I just wanted to add in something. I didn't, I was the moderator for today, so, uh, but what I can mention, I, um, I work here at RCMLD uh, within the Savia team. We have had programs, uh, like for example, that are still going on, the Quality Index Insurance Certification, uh, project that is um, uh, we are working in collaboration with the University of California Davis and we have developed uh, frameworks and tools to help um, insurance agriculture insurance companies to be able to design relevant products that actually detect losses when they happen and make payouts when they are supposed to to do that um, we also have another ongoing project that is looking at inclusion of gender and we are partnering and collaborating with insurance uh, companies. So there are these ongoing uh, um, uh, um, initiatives and uh, I don't want to brag so much but pass, pass through our booth uh, during the breaks at Savia and uh, you'll get more information on those. Yeah, just to uh, boost a bit on uh, Lauren's answer. Yeah, uh, I'll hand over the program because of time. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. There's a the last question, uh, which was on uh, climate uh, projection. Uh, the in best scenario. I think also the, the question is still addressed to Lurin and uh, Abigail. Maybe Abigail can address that, please. All right. Thank you so much for bringing this up. This is a really, really good point. Um, and just to get us all on the same page about climate data, because it can be really complicated. There are certain representative concentration pathways or RCPs associated with future climate models. It ranges from the worst case scenario, which is known as 8.5. That's the situation in which humans don't respond to climate change. We actually increase our emissions. And then the best case scenario, which is 2.5 or the often cited target of 4.5. So 4.5 is looking like the most realistic right now. That's if we meet all of the goals established in the Paris Climate Agreement. So that's looking at um, a pretty optimistic, but now even potentially realistic decrease in emissions over the next um, 80 years or so. So those are all the basically different paths we have open to us, depending on the initiative that the initiative that initiatives that humans take to reduce emissions. And yes, I did run this analysis or I did present this analysis on the worst case scenario, um, partially because to show, first of all, how bad things can be if we don't take action, but also it looks a little bit better on a smaller screen. You can see the difference um, more strongly when we use more extreme examples. I did run this analysis also for 4.5 as a baseline or not a baseline, but as kind of a counter example. Um, and I'm happy to share that with you if you'd like to take a look. It, of course, is a bit more optimistic and it is important to look at those more optimistic and potentially even like more likely scenarios as well, because 8.5 is looking um, a lot less likely now. Um, but with that said, one thing I'd like to kind of bring up about this climate data that I don't necessarily have an answer to is so all of it is looking at the bioclimate in the year 2050. So what is the average temperature in the winter? 
how much rain do you receive in the summer, that kind of thing. And all of those are really just averages. So, you know, it doesn't take into consideration, perhaps you receive a normal amount of rain in July, but all of that rain comes within a, during a major storm and, you know, you get six inches of rain in one day. And those extremes are what we really are seeing even around the globe, even just in the past few weeks. If you look at the droughts in places like China and Europe, if you look at some major storms like the one in Pakistan, we really need to be taking into consideration not just these um, kind of broad changes in climate, but these more extreme events as well and what that means for crops and things like that. So that's just kind of a tangential point, And I hope I answered your question. But, you know, with this climate data, it can be really complicated. There are lots of different ways to look at it. We should be looking at all scenarios, but also looking at extreme events and the impacts that they'll have more acutely on all of us. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, uh, that should be the last question. I, before we just uh, close, I'd like to recognize the presence of uh, Yuri Boga. Uh, Yuri Boga is uh, from the Office of the President uh, under the delivery, President Delivery Unit, and advisor to government on matters to do with and GIS. Maybe, Yuri, you can just move to the audience here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think. Uh, uh, as we come to close of the question session, uh, we have all our contacts, uh, emails, we we'll circulate the presentations to you. And uh, in case of any other burning questions, I think uh, the presenters will have their emails with us and we'll be able to contact them for any further engagement and questions. Uh, I want us just to give a round again to our presenters yeah. for the good presentation and also to ourselves for being patient. Thank you very much. Maybe that's all I can hear about you to just close. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. Uh, um, so I think it's lunchtime and most of us know the venue, so feel free to uh, go for lunch. And uh, um, if you have further questions, uh, you can make sure to, uh, uh, you know, try to catch a table with one of the presenters and get further discussions and then lastly also if you came in after i had announced those who need covid tests please you proceed to the aar uh, 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 booth otherwise with those uh, um, uh, few remarks of the long presentations we've had i wish you a wonderful afternoon and enjoy your lunch <laughs> special and environmental planning. Um, the work that I'm going to present to you today on uh, assessment of special temporal vegetation damage to, due to desert rockcast uh, using a case study of Turkana County is one of the work that I did during my undergraduate studies under the supervision of um, Dr. Elifat Abdelaman, Dr. Bestam Deredi, uh, Dr. Eni Tunang, and Emily Kimati of the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, and under the supervision of uh, Professor Simon Onyere of the Department of Spatial and Environmental Planning, Kenyatta University. In this work, we try to look at uh, the kind of damage the desert workers have caused to vegetation in Trukana County. Uh, as you are aware, in the year 2019, 2020 to 2021, we had uh, an invasion of the satro cast in the Horn of Africa, uh, affecting countries such as uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, <coughs> and in East Africa, we had also Kenya as a country being affected by this particular invasion, uh, especially in the northern part of the country, where you realize that uh, this particular invasion had um, a serious damage on now. Uh, Croplands and pasturelands. Pasturelands, uh, due to their nature of high ability to migrate over long distances, crossing borders, and of course, <coughs> aggravated by the change in climate, uh, in the factors of uh, precipitation, temperature, humidity, as well as ecological conditions such as edaphic factors of uh, soil moisture. These are just some of the key factors that really contribute to the uh, breeding and as well as the survival of the desert rockers 
also yeah. with vegetation being the main food for this particular species uh, of the desert locust. Uh, our study site was in Trucada County, which is one of the northern uh, counties in the country. And also, this is just home to pastoralists and agropastries communities who largely depend on uh, pastures and also crop crops such as maize and sorghum for their survival and also to support their rifle uh, as much as community, communities as you all know. Uh, in the year 2020, these particular communities were really affected when uh, the desert rockers really affected or invaded this particular region, uh, which is a semi-arid region in the northern part of the country, whereby it really resulted to serious damage affecting these particular communities, which were at the wake of recovering from a, a two-year-long drought all the way from the year 2018. Uh, but unfortunately, at this particular point in time, in the year 2020, they also were thrown back to a serious setback of affecting their rival, whereby they actually depend on those particular aspects. Uh, the key objective of this particular study, we, were, we aimed at determining or assessing the damage that uh, the desert locust have had on now. Uh, vegetation in Chukana County, as well as also predicting locally the current and the future potential of desert rockers after distribution uh, and a changing climate in Chukana County. Uh, in this study, we utilize a, a set of data sets where we consider the currency records, that's for the desert rockers from a FAO, we also consider the climatic variables that is of precipitation <laughs> and temperature as key variables in this particular in the modeling activity to just predict the future and also the current conditions for the habitat of this particular species of desert rockers. Um, in the modeling part, we also the data was just processed and uh, we utilized the max the maximum enthalpy modeling approach, whereby we try to predict the, the habitat. And also, NDVI analysis was performed in the Google Earth engine to determine the damage that has been caused by this particular desert locus, and also to perform change between the period of focus, that is May to July 2020. And also, produce models and vegetation indices, uh, maps, just to as our outputs to, to indicate the suitable after distribution and also to show vegetation damage in the area, the study area. Um, in the first objective where we were looking at uh, the damage caused by the desert locusts in the, in the region of uh, in the, in the, the Sukana County, uh, as you can see we have NDVA analysis maps just to indicate on our um, the state of vegetation in the three select months, that is of May, June, and July 2020. Uh, from the maps, if I can just give an overview of what the color code is, we can see we have uh, a brown shade uh, that indicates low NDVI. I also have shades of green to darker green. So the shades of light green, they indicate medium performance of vegetation at the, the, uh, at the county. And also, the darker uh, shade of green, that one indicates high, very high performance of vegetation in that particular region. And then the first one is May, as I uh, said, the second one is June, and we can just appreciate that uh, through that visualization that the performance of this particular vegetation in the, in the month of May was high, and you can also see a decrease across, and then <coughs> July as well, you can get to appreciate that uh, there's also some sort of increase and decrease in those areas. Uh, we also have the, the dots, we, we have the dots of blue, the dark blue. Those ones, they just indicate the presence of desert rockers, where desert rockers were spotted during this particular period. That is from April all the way to, to July. Uh, to just show that uh, what we got out of this particular assessment, this uh, NDVI trend analysis for the three months, that is from May, June, and July, we can get to appreciate those graphs, the trends. And uh, 
we can clearly see that in May we had this, this, the, the, the performance was going high and low, just indicating that the, the vegetation was being disturbed. As we also move to June, we can also see that there is also a, a decline in that trend, with also a possible increase at the, the that week of uh, that month, that is in June, and also a decline towards the end of the month of June. Coming to July, we can get also to see that uh, from the start of the, the month, there was a decline, uh, and there was a low performance of uh, vegetation in that particular area. And of course, into the second week to the third week, we can see higher performance of vegetation, but also a possible decline into the end of the month. And uh, this will indicate that uh, in June, we could also see that vegetation performance was decreasing, as well as, of course, as Julia has also explained, is that uh, there's a sharp increase in the second week and a decline in vegetation from the third week into the end of the month. Uh, coming to the damage analysis, we, we, we performed a change calculation between the months. That is, uh, for instance, we have a map just indicating the change from uh, May to June, whereby we just performed uh, a change calculation. Uh, subtracting the month of June from May to see any change and or any decline. And uh, as the map indicates that uh, where we have the shades of red, they, they, decry, they, they indicate a decline in the vegetation. And also where we have shades of uh, yellow, that one indicates no change at that particular point. And also where we have green, it indicates an increase in the vegetation from the previous month. Therefore, by just doing this assessment, uh, you could clearly see that there is a decline, especially looking at the middle of that particular uh, end. We, we just extract a section where uh, much of the data was collected at that particular end, and especially in Roima sub-county, which was one of the sub-counties that was noted to be much infected, invested with this particular desarrollers. Uh, as a face in that particular end, and you can clearly see that where we just have those dots of blue indicating the presence of desert rockers at that particular point, there is shades of red indicating that there was a disturbance in the vegetation, there was a damage that uh, uh, started out of that particular uh, investigation. And also, we have a uh, a graph just indicating as well that showing the distribution of this particular change. Uh, as you can see, the red line in that particular graph is skewed towards the negative, that is from zero. You can see to, towards negative 0 0.5. And at that particular area, when you look at that skewness, it just shows you that in that month, there was a decline in vegetation based on the change calculation that we performed in this particular end. And also looking at towards the positive side, there's no much, uh, there's no much increase in that particular end. Also showing that in that particular month, that is from May to June, we never had a, really a serious increase in this particular uh, vegetation in that particular area. And also from our statistics there, we can just see that uh, in June we had a, a, a higher percentage change of the the, the, the vegetation with negative 18.4 percent. Uh, coming to the next month of June to July, uh, the vegetation damage analysis shows that uh, uh, we had uh, a decline in vegetation, but it's not that much as compared to the previous month of June, uh, from May to June. Uh, and it also clearly shows that from that same area that we just uh, indicated there, we can see that we have the shades of red just maintained as a decrease. Shades of yellow, of, of course, showing no change, as well as the, the, the green indicating uh, an increase in that particular end. Um, this just shows you that in this particular month, June to July analysis, there was no much the, the decline in vegetation, even though there is, but they, so we could also see that from the month of June to July, we have an increase in vegetation. Uh, also, we just performed uh, a prediction to just see the suitable 
the current condition of the habitat, which areas are suitable for this particular pest, that's the desert locust. And we could see, clearly see from our model that 27% uh, of the total area is predicted to be optimal uh, under these current conditions as of 2020. Uh, when I talk about optimal conditions, we can just see at that particular map, we have shades of uh, dark uh, blue, that's royal blue, sorry, indicating low, very low suitability. We have yellow shades, of course, showing uh, low suitability. We have, um, we have yellow, uh, showing moderate suitability. We have light green, uh, showing high, and also darker green, showing very high suitability. So the optimal suitability that I'm referring to here is that from where we have the light green to darker green. So you could see that in the current condition, 27% of the total area in the country, I mean the, the, the county, sorry, is optimal, is predicted to be optimal for the desert locus. With Trukana, Trukana Central, Trukana South, Roima constituents, I mean Roima sub-counties, as well as the parts of uh, Trukana East predict to be highly suitable actors under the current conditions. Predicting to the future, that is 2030, under the shared socioeconomic pathways, uh, we can see that uh, this particular shared socioeconomic pathways these are just narratives that are trying to show the projection of the climate, the global society, how will it behave towards the, the next century. Uh, and then the shared socioeconomic pathways in this particular case for 245, it indicates middle of the road, whereby the group of society behaves taking the historical pattern and also this struggle to just maintain or just towards sustainability. But these uh, developments that are at a, a slow base, but of course with the intensity of our uh, energy <coughs> use being trained to be reduced, but still at our office. So looking at that scenario, we can just see that um, the area was predicted to be, we predict that the suitability will just reduce with 23% and only 9% of the total area being optimal, just maintaining that the optimal area is from the right green, darker green, uh, in 2030. And also looking at also into the future at a different uh, climatic scenario, which is S SSP 585, uh, which is now the worst scenario whereby, of course, there are no intervention based on these particular narratives. There's no climatic policy intervention. So at this particular point, the world is at its maximum. Development in technology is at its peak. And also, there's no constraint in the development. So at that particular end, we also realize that uh, uh, that five percent of the total area is predicted to be suitable, with only just twenty percent of the area being an optimal habitat for the desert locusts in 2030. Uh, looking at the SSP 245 with the, the global warming uh, afraid at uh, about 3.3 degrees Celsius, and also the SSP 58 also averaged at the long term average being at about 6.0 degrees Celsius, we see that the optimal suitability range will decrease to about 9% and also 20% from the current conditions, which is at 27% respectively. And also, looking at that particular scenario, you realize that uh, we have the shades of light green and uh, dark green shifting towards the sub-counties of Rema and Tukana, sub-counties in the SSP 585 in the future, that is at 2030, and uh, there is a serious shift towards that, even though there is a decrease in the optimal suitability for this particular pest. That, that also means this particular region or this county is at risk of inefficient in those particular projections, and that will also, looking at the, pro, the, the looking at the damage assessment that we've done, that the desert workers, they also have that ability to cause damage to vegetation, which at the end would affect the neighborhood of any community. Uh, therefore, this particular region is as well at the risk of this. So, therefore, we conclude that uh, climate variability has an influence in the geographical distribution of uh, desert rockers. 
uh, of course, with uh, some of the areas which are suitable currently being suitable, and of course, also the suitability will be decreasing, but it will be concentrating to some other sub counties that are, of course, of concern. Uh, and also, the current uh, optimal <coughs> actor suitability is larger compared to the predicted future, with sub, -co sub counties of Roima and Trukana South being the main core or just some of the areas which are much likely to be affected as well in the future. It's also a, a conclusion that uh, continuous monitoring is so necessary to just help with time assessment of this particular as uh, innovations. You can see my screen? Yes, you can see it. Okay, so, but you won't be able to see me because I'm not in the audiovisual to have access to the camera. No problem. That's fine. Okay. So, I will be presenting on a separate geodesy for climatological studies in Malawi. This is just the part of the uh, say research which uh, we are supposed to proceed in the near future to come up with a real-time real system to uh, say be determining the uh, say parameters regarding the uh, say meteorology. So without wasting much of your time, I will take you through the introduction, objectives, methodology, <coughs> sample results, then I will conclude with the, uh, say, some remarks. So I start with the introduction. Uh, geodetic receivers uh, are a valuable resource in satellite uh, geodesy, especially these are used in uh, water vapor estimation. Despite that uh, we use this in uh, water vapor estimation, Malawi is still behind, uh, especially in using these receivers, uh, especially for, uh, say, the determination of, I uh, say, meteorological parameters in this study of, I uh, say, climate. So, what is important, I uh, say, regarding this, or why do we matter about, I uh, say, climatological issues in, as a, in Malawi as a country. <coughs> so the basic issue behind the, this study is to evaluate the meteorological parameters by taking advantage of uh, global positioning system measurements and of course the, the GLONASS measurements. GLONASS is simply a global navigation service system of course, in the Russia language, they pronounce it as the indicated here. I don't know how to pronounce it. So, so, far, so, far. <laughs> so I say, why I say GPS and why GLONASS? The issue here is that uh, from GPS and uh, GLONASS, we can have these observations from uh, the ex uh, as, uh, issues which are there in Malawi, uh, access them for uh, potential application in uh, climate studies. Or in other words, the geodetic receivers which uh, are there in Malawi, are they suitable for climatic studies? Can we use them for climatic studies? So I'm trying to answer that simple question in the next few slides. So, a question? Question? No, oh. continue. Okay. Yeah, so in order to do this, uh, I have uh, data sets from uh, the preparedness for East African countries through seismic resilience as engineering. These stations are simply called prepare under this project, which is called prepare. And uh, on top of that one, I have uh, the Malawi Continuously Operating Reference Stations, or the course network within uh, Malawi. Without uh, splitting this state, it is the, uh, all this, this. How did I uh, say come up with, I uh, said the, to deduce the results, I used of the GPS and the ground processings, of which well, I, I GPS alone, 
In the other scheme, I use a combined for GPS and the GLONASS. So how do I do the processing? I use the least squares adjustment in order to calculate the weight delay or the zenith weight delay and the, the precipitable water vapor or just the precipitation using the, G, say the GPS and GLONASS signals. I also measure the temperature I say pressure and the humidity. So that is the, what I do, I say using the least squares in adjustment using these available resources. So in terms of observation availability, here I calculate the number of satellites for a duration of, I say, August 17 to August 20 in 2019. What you see here, the different colors capture the time series of uh, the satellites with the respect to each uh, say station here. I have uh, this is I have one, two, three, four, five stations. I have five stations, and uh, what I have here is just uh, the uh, say the change in the uh, number of satellites with respect to time for these stations. Why does the number of satellites matter? The number of satellites matters because we have to make sure that they reach a minimum number to be used in position. So what I can see here, or what you can see here, is drop to, but the maximum can be somewhere around nine. So in Am I too fast? <laughs> With the uh, the nose. Oh, yeah, questions? If you have questions, you can pause me. No, no continue. Okay. Okay, so I say this is the, this slide that just demonstrates the number of satellites, but uh, using a uh, bonus. And uh, I just capture the number of satellites here for, I say, I uh, say for this, for one of the stations for GLONASS in terms of the sky plot. And uh, I can have at least uh, 10 satellites which I can use in the calculation of uh, the meteorological parameters. And uh, in this slide, uh, I have uh, a combination of uh, GPS and GLONASS. So you see here the density of uh, the points increases here, meaning that uh, when GPS and GLONASS are combined, uh, the number of satellites also in so is also in terms of the sky plot. So in terms of the sky plot, this one is for GPS, this one is for asset bonus, and the combination you see the number of satellites here increases. So this is most important in terms of uh, I say the least squares adjustment when we, we are deducing the meteorological parameters. So the in terms of uh, assessing whether these stations could be used uh, for meteorological parameter calculation, here I use this simple heat map, I say of which uh, the colors uh, indicate uh, no data, I say no solution, and uh, where I indicate uh, climatological, it means uh, this color means that uh, for those days uh, the observations are suitable for calculating the meteorological parameters. That's in general what this simple uh, say plot indicates in this one. But uh, I use uh, GLONASS only. What happens when I use, I uh, uh, say, a combination, uh, a combination of GLONASS and GPS? I will show you in the next slide. So as I've indicated here, the colors uh, indicate that I uh, uh, say we can use those uh, observations in those days for climatological parameters, especially this uh, color here. So. This changes when the GPS is combined to GLONASS. More observations could be used for calculation of meteorological parameters, as can be seen in this slide. So, in terms of the estimations, the amount of, I uh, say, uh, the weight delay or the weight content within the air, when we use GLONASS, this is the, the time series, which you have just plotted the, the number of satellites below here to show its relationship to 
the changes in uh, as, uh, the weight delay or the weight as a paper within uh, as, uh, the measured uh, as, uh, values. So here I have the zenith weight delay time series with respect to number of uh, satellites at different uh, stations. So what you see here, I have uh, the weight delay at all the stations uh, somewhere between 10 to 10 to 20 centimeters. Hello everyone. I'm Sagan Chalu from Ethiopia. I'm lecturer at the Greenland University, or home of University of Greenland, due to its greenness and the full of biodiversity and the virus ecosystem systems. And as you see on the logo, let me introduce that plant. It is also Mother Land International Brand Coffee called Girgaza Pe Coffee. In case if you need contact me, okay. As you see in the picture middle, I'm sure uh, you, will, you will get some information. It presents my present my research area called Puch Pound, Southwestern Ethiopia, remotely, where the little towns are currently are growing only on the flat areas, most of areas, as you see, so rugged due to some environmental challenges. So, okay, there is objectives. The objectives are just to determine weight relationships between the life state problem and the factors. What factors are there? Which factors are there going on? What is the importance of the factors? Finally, to model the sustainability rate, land state sustainability rate in the Steady area. Okay. Here, methods in the data to the left right, to the left side, there are different data sources which are used for this modeling. <coughs> to the right, to the right part, there is a methods. As you see, there is two broad broad uh, steps. The first box represents data collection and the preparation steps. The second box presents data modeling. Steps. So it encompasses seven steps. The first step is data set equations from different sources, as here presented left side. The second, the second end, the third one is the main data set for this modeling. These are the thematic layers or the post factors, thematic rasters for which assumed casing landscape in the steady areas, such as topographic, hydrologic, geological proximities in the landscape. Here, the third, the, third, the, third one, the third step is inventory analysis. All the possible landscape polygons, which currently and previously we are called, which further divided into training and testing data sets, where 80% of that such polygons are used to train the model, and 20% of data used to test the model. And then, the middle one, the fourth step, is the model, uh, this, the extraction step, where these two data, the inventory, dance polygons, and the landslide casualty thematic rasters in this sector, in order to extract the landslide grid units or landslide pixels from such casualty factors. Then the lower box represents the modeling step. The fifth step is training, where the model started to train to extracted data sets, where the observed and the expected data sets compare it to compare it where we can we can we can we can check the error or RMS error between such learnings by optim by checking optimizing model or if it's satisfied we can get the relationship results general weight results. Finally we can as a sixth step the step of the sixth step is the validation step where in the above steps, we were, in the above steps, only that only the model was trained to the to the problems, to the landslide problems. But in sixth step, we have to check, we have to validate the for, we have to validate the, with the data which we weren't used, which wasn't used in the training data, using the test data. After finally, finally, if we accepted the that data, we can model the model, we can model the sustainability in the steady area. So here, 
the first one is the trailing and the testing result is where that 1482 and 530 trailing and testing grid units were extracted to the this <coughs> that the table below it represents the detailed uh, description of such numbers here to the lower corner of the left side represents the model learning phases where four learning phases were applied as you see here where network structures Natural structures is called input, input, hidden, and the output structures were applied where, as you see, uh, early in this error, there is a decreasing order, order of the errors. So the right corner represents the model validation result is where area of an area under curve and the row result shows 95, 94, and 88 percent of the predictive and the success rate is the normally acceptable rate. Is. So the mean the small table shows the capability of the model which try to classify landslide and landslide and landslide and landslide classes correctly. Yes, this one is to show the grammatical is the training phase. Okay, this this are for the relax and for some information, steady area information. Okay, these are the results based on the objective. The first one is generalized with what is the relation between landslide, landslide events, problems, and the causative factors. So, accordingly, in this diagram, in these pictures, you can assume that for each box, taking the middle of the horizontal, the zero, middle, above the, that horizontal, above that zero, and then above, taking the above that horizontal level. The parameters data distribution, data distribution so that that parameter is highly related or high positive or strong relationship with case with causing landslide and those below that line is negatively uh, when some factors below the above services to buy dual relationship accordingly here proximity to fault proximity to drain proximity to the road this this factors shows positive relationship. Again, again, considering, okay, there is Again, a slope, elevation, as you see, a slope is just showing as all the data is above the zero. That is a strong relationship. Elevation, another time, the opposite, which is hit, which shows below and above. This is because where there is elevation, sometimes they may, they, they may not be landslides. But for a slope, that is, may not be true. Again, for NDV, top of weight in the index, again, profile curvatures, plane curvatures, for example, plane curvature shows a positive, positive relationship with landslide. Here, profile curvature shows dual, one up and down. Again, at the left side, then agricultural or land, land use classes, where among the land use classes, as you see there, Agriculture shows very positive value. Settlement as a settlement, positive value. Again, sparse vegetation, positive. Forest, as you see, if there is forest, there may not be landslide. That is well shown here. So, there shows there is no relationship with forest. That was their own natural relationship. So, for my model, such as for to optimize my model, I can remove, I can filter out such parameters, for, for instance. For instance, forest. As I say, for red land, as you see, red land. Red land means very strong. There might not be landslide occurrence. So it is shown well. There is no, there is no relationship. Again, for the rivers, for where there is a river, along the river, since from the river part, no landslide problems have been taken. That is why it is again neutral. The same is for, but the opposite is for bare lands and shrubs. There is a strong relationship. That means the polygons were landslide polygons were intersected with, with, with such bare lands, bare land areas. Okay. The same is true for three soil classes found in the steady area. Accordingly, the last one has no relationship. But the two lands, two soil parts, especially, were highly intersected with landslide polygons.
Okay. This is the most very important result, which against this model, with the capability of this model was, it able to show the interaction or the relationship between factors, for instance, between slope and elevation, between, between topographic weight and the, the plane curvature. Again, it shows overall role of the factors, which factor, rate. It rates <coughs> each factor's role. For instance, it achieves at the left side a slope 0.72 star 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 alone. So that means from all factors, a slope behaves the most strong factor. So it is best nice indicator accordingly for proximity parameters, agriculture, settlement, bar land, and bar achieves strong relations. That means covariate, covariates. Pairwise results. Okay, here as you see. The final diagnosis has to be so this is a model. The model is that related uh, range to zero, zero to eight. Further, further analysis with, with the GIS environment. Again, since the study was along the roadside, so here some road sections were also delineated for some, uh, just to show some red, red air. Road first were identified. So, population, the population here, as we see, general weight in the pairwise really does slope is the most influencing factor due to the human activity, the proper land use planning. As you see from the results, the most problem in the study was the improper land use planning due to the rugged topography, people and the farmers, agriculture moves to for their harvesting, for their farmland, for their life earning to, towards the slope areas. So that factors were well identified. Road corners are most sustainable and analysis so, appropriate music has been taken. Generally, this the current model was successfully learned the problem and it it due to the test uh, result validation results. Therefore, outcomes can be used for footprint for further studies and for some applications. However, there is a need of further there is a need of further studies, including such as temporal monitoring, especially such as deformation studies and the comparative studies, because there are very important, currently important modeling applications, software made in made machine learning and other methods. So there is a need of such comparative studies for further use it. So the proposed application areas is the most Identified application areas of this research is land use planning because what is revealed in the study is where the land use cover classes, especially as we see, especially for instance, most of the agricultural purposes were or cut for cultivation, crop, crop, crop cultivation purposes were practicing along the slope areas, along the road corners, even along the river shores. Just People uh, enforce it to do such, but due to the terrain, terrain or the, the terrain character of the state area in the food security. So there is a need of hard working on land use planning, planning again in leader, leader infrastructure planning, planning. For instance, the city, the, in the city area, as you see in the pictures, two main roads, two main roads. Along that road, is, there are many things going on. So most of the time identified, most of the Road parts identified they are susceptible to. This research can be used for further such site location, site suitability <coughs> analysis. So these are the core sectors which can be used for this research uh, for stakeholders, food security and early emergency disasters. So on. Thank you. Sorry for my. Um, just wanted to so introduce him first of all, introduce myself, so Olivia Cotre, I'm Director of Humanitarian Solutions at ESRI, um, and my colleague uh, from our partner organization, Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, uh, Rahim Dabaria, who's the Geospatial Program Manager there. So he will be presenting to you uh, on work that they are doing, um, so the, the ACA works in uh, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Syria. So we're going to be leaving Africa uh, for this presentation. But interestingly enough, we're going to be picking up from uh, the previous presentation that was looking at uh, monitoring landslide 
uh, hazards. Uh, and in fact, most of the presentations we've been looking at today have been about monitoring hazards, measuring the hazards. Um, but of course, a hazard only becomes a risk uh, when it is in proximity to things of interest, people or infrastructure. That's when it becomes a risk, when, when the exposure is measured, when vulnerability is measured. And so this is what we're going to be looking at now. Rahim is going to be presenting on work that they are doing at a community level to really measure vulnerability due to hazards. And then based on that, what do you do to reduce that vulnerability, to reduce that exposure? So I'm going to hand over to, to Rahim virtually. I'll just hand over to pick over the, the video here. And then I'll finish off with two or three slides to, to conclude. Hi, this is Rahim Dobriya from Agar Khan Agency for Habitat, Haka, in Agency of Agar Khan Development Network. I will present the case Agar Vulnerability and Risk Assessment Approach is being used in Haka for DRF work. Haka aims to reduce the, the risk with the integrated and proactive approach. We use HVR approach developed around ECGIS solution that help us and communities understand the risk, design, implement appropriate risk management measures plan for safer development of the village and town. We have internalized the risk screening process with the scientific base. Thus, GIS technology and HVRA approach have become the backbone for the ARCA DR work and anticipatory action for short term and, uh, and long term. The ARCA HVRA approach is standardized approach and methodology and tool for systematic risk assessment to identify hazard within a settlement and vulnerability of the community. Uh, it is developed based on international risk framework. We adopted from the Switzerland and improved over the period of time based on local context. It is a community-centric assessment tool with a strong community engagement throughout the process. It is deployed using GIS technology. We use our GIS software that provide rich backend database and special analysis functionality. The methodology framework helps us to assess the extent to which communities are exposed to hazard and degree of the vulnerability. The risk is defined based on two main pillars or indicators, hazard exposure and vulnerability. The graph is given on the right side, shows an example of multi-hazard risk profiling of the several settlements, including the degree of exposure and the vulnerability. Analysis informs DRR planning at a regional level, selecting appropriate intervention based on ground situation. ACTA operational geographies represent multi-hazard environment, prone to debris flow, flash flood, avalanche, landslide, cyclone, and many other hazards. Out of our sales 2,500 settlement, 77% are exposed to multi-hazard, and 94% are exposed to at least one type of hazard. This very process consists of four stages, starting with the off-site desktop assessment, followed by on-site field assessment, then validation and analysis in form of maps and statistics. Dissemination of the result is the final stage in which analysis and finding are communicated to the relevant stakeholder in form of document through a presentation and discussion. The result of the HVRA are incorporated into the village disaster management plan. Through this BDMP, ARCA together with the community identify and develop implementation plan for DRR intervention. After the assessment, data are collected through the different sources and approaches considering local context, such as data available with local authority, remote sensing data, drone imagery, field investigation, and a participatory risk assessment exercise. We have more than 70 plus members spread across five countries, consist of CIS experts, geology, geomorphology, hydrology, sociology, structural engineer. We use scientific approach part of the assessment, but at the same time, indigenous knowledge of the community is also important for the HVRA because our program area are typically hard to reach, prone to multiple complex hazards, and around 75% are located above 1,000 meter altitude. The list of high level indicator, data collection point, <coughs> being collected part of the assessment. The data help to understand community strength to protect from the disaster and weakness that make them more vulnerable. That help further to define the risk reduction intervention. So HR has been considered as a knowledge hub for ACA DRR work and help 
decision maker and other concerned stakeholder to design an accurate operational picture of critical scenario before, during, and after disaster. These are the list of examples shows and its application. The visual level product for MEP that is very important for community to understand risk and based on that implement DRR intervention at local level. It may avail to community to know area exposed to hazard and relatively safe area that help in risk sensitive land use planning. It helps to design hazard specific preparedness interventions such as structural mitigation, uh, conduct awareness session, training, uh, established stockpile, early warning system. Because of time constraint, now I will very quickly show some how GIS technology and HURA result help to implement disaster risk reduction intervention and anticipatory action. So HURA result helps to develop village disaster management plan and communicate to the community. So far, more than 1600 settlements are covered through the village disaster management plan. What is the HURA process? Result and finding are communicated to the relevant stakeholder and more important release to the communities. This is the point where we identify local level intervention and develop short and long term implementation plan for this reduction. The process helps design context specific solutions with the greater community ownership. The capacity of the community is very important to prevent, respond, and recover from the disaster. HRA result helps to build the capacity of the community based on hazard and vulnerability scenario of each village. So far, more than 40,000 volunteers are trained. So our mitigation work. First, we try to see if we can implement mitigation work using environmental friendly solution. This is the one of the examples where settlement were protected to flood and avalanche through the replantation intervention. It can help us to identify over the 600 settlement prone to avalanche. ACA has developed holistic avalanche risk reduction program for this settlement. This example so avalanche hazard control and mitigation technique is implemented using defensive structure in one of the avalanche from village. Another example where mitigation intervention implemented to protect from avalanche for the site identified for the safe center construction. HR result helped to design and build protective wall for the flood. Using HBAR data and GIS technology, we have identified settlements that are high risk in the remote area and without mobile or internet connectivity. Because of snowfall or other disasters like landslide, flood, this village is completely cut off from the urban center for a couple of months. We have provided emergency communication system and early warning system. Thank you very much. I am happy to answer any of your questions. You can reach out to me through the email and mention here. Good a little bit. So, uh, what I really like about Akka's work there, what you, the, the, the work that Rahim does, is really uh, this connection between the, the sort of scientific method of measuring uh, hazards and connecting that to policy making at national and also local. Uh, level. In fact, uh, the, the very, uh, during the, the opening session of, of this conference, uh, Dr. Emmanuel mentioned this very point, uh, that one of our big responsibilities as a community is to identify how we can make the connection between the technology that we handle so well, uh, and the science, and the policy making. Because at the end of the day, if you know, the products that we produce are just left on a shelf and not turned into policy or, or action, then we might as well not, not do them. So I think that's a really nice example with Akala of really making that link between the science and the and, and the fine and the, um, and the and the policies and the prevention risk risk reduction measures. Just to conclude, then I just wanted to say the work that we do um, with with Akka and many other partners, many many of ourselves, in fact, inscribes itself again in this sort of impact orientation. How do we how do we make sure that the GIS technology, uh, the remote sensing technology that we have access to has impact uh, in various aspects. So we have this umbrella initiative called, called GIS for Good. There's a, a little QR code that you can take here and it takes you to the website uh, of GIS for Good. Um, and within that umbrella of GIS for Good, we have a number of programs. We have the education program, we have the conservation program. My, my uh, colleague David Gadsden uh, has spoken on, on that. Uh, but we also have the disaster response program, 
and the non-profit program. And those are programs that are specifically designed to make accessible uh, some uh, ESRI technology for those purposes and for non-profit organizations uh, at, you know, in, in, a sustainable, in a sustainable way. Uh, as part of that work, uh, we're developing what we're calling uh, the Humanitarian GIS Hub, uh, which is built around a, a, a sort of classification of humanitarian use cases around the disaster risk management cycle that I was showing just earlier on that slide, and to try and really foster uh, a conversation around precisely how we can turn the science and the technology into impact, into humanitarian impact, into disaster risk reduction and disaster management, uh, disaster, uh, management and response. So this hub there, you can also visit uh, using this QR code. Um, if you want to take that one down, and I can leave that one up for, for, a, for a second. Uh, and while I mentioned that as part of this work, we're also working on uh, fostering a community of practice around disaster risk management, um, a, de a decentralized community of practice around uh, disaster risk management. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that uh, traditionally, uh, humanitarian response, disaster response has been very much hub and spoke. It's been a couple hubs of expertise that are then deployed um, on a project basis to, to disasters to respond. What we are working uh, on with various partners, including RCMRD, is to try and create a more of a mesh, a decentralized network of capacity in the application of GIS to disaster response. Um, and we're actually working with the RCMRD uh, to organize an event uh, in, uh, in December, actually, um, on specifically the application of GIS to disaster response. This there, last QR code, uh, takes you to a, a survey form uh, that allows you to express interest in attending, as this is really just for information purposes, so that we get a, a sense of who might be interested in, in attending this. The idea is really to, to run uh, workshops at regional levels that focus on the demand side, that focus on the disaster risk uh, and the disaster management community, the, disaster man the national disaster management authorities, and look at what their requirements are, what are their needs in terms of coordinating and managing disasters. What are those needs that we as a community can respond to? How can we target our response? How can we target, better target our development so that they respond to their specific to their specific demand and specific needs. So I encourage you to take a, to, to go onto that form and express your uh, interest if you would like, uh, if you are interested in participating, it'll be uh, here at RCMRD. Uh, uh, at some point in December, we haven't actually decided on a, on a date yet. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, and I guess we'll be taking some questions now. So the objective of the presentation will be a very short one to introduce you to Digital Africa and also if you've been here, you visited our booth uh, where our colleagues were there presenting uh, Digital Africa. So before the small interruption of introducing the Digital Africa program, uh, it has been uh, today's our third year anniversary. The program started here at ASMRD Safe Place at the RIC 2019 and the program is here with us in Africa now, hosted in South Africa National Space Agency, working with partners across the continent. So the aim of this short presentation is to introduce to you the platform and uh, have a feel of the data sets that you can access, services, uh, have a feel of the platform, and I'll work with my colleague to do a short demo, just that you can see, and with the opportunity, if you have internet, you can actually try. So, so do you have internet? Oh, okay, so at least I think it was switched for a purpose so that you can focus and I'll have your participation. So this program is uh, providing uh, data for the continent and from this small example it could be a quiz. Uh, it's an image somewhere in Africa. It's normally called the Eye of Sahara. Uh, it's in uh, Mali, Mauritania. I don't know if I showed you the picture of uh, Lake Victoria, would you recognize it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just checking if you're in the right uh, room. 
So our vision is to provide this analysis of data to support the various sectors, uh, agriculture by hand of people in food security, uh, people in water sector, <coughs> not sure again, okay, <laughs> people uh, leading with land degradation or land management, yes, people dealing with urbanization, not sure, coastal erosion, people dealing with everything, like Dr. Kishoro at Jekwant, <laughs> our student, <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. So our program is diverse, helping us address most of these issues, and also we provide the data to everybody, uh, leaving no one behind. You could be working from government, NGO, private sector. Uh, the program is aimed to empower you to be able to do much, much more. Uh, look at the food productivity over time, uh, water over time, even look at flood risk areas, land protection, urbanization, how has Nairobi grown over time, and coast erosion, how is our coast of Mombasa changing over time? So our program is therefore diverse and inclusive. Uh, like in this uh, venue, we have many people from different uh, countries, uh, from different sectors, from different uh, uh, log uh, ecological zones. Uh, we have the youth, we have the people. So we are all in the right uh, session. So we are working with our partners. So our program is hosted at the South African National Space Agency where we are at Regional Centre, it's our implementing partner. We're also working with other partners like Agreement in Niger, we're working with the Africans in Nigeria, working with the CSC in Senegal, another institution in Tunisia, as well as uh, AfriGeo. So do you know today is, uh, which rank is this? Fifth or sixth? Arsemati Conference? In the fifth, eh? I was just checking if we're in the right uh, week. <laughs> so the data sets and services, which is very important for us. So in a nutshell, we provide analysis-ready data from free and open satellites, Landsat, Sentinel, from the various uh, respective agencies, and we make it, we prepare it in analysis-ready format so as to support uh, your learning at CFTI, your, your teaching students, uh, to empower governments, empower ministries, departments, empower NGOs, empower everybody to use this. And also look at maybe our national development goals. For example, the national development goal for the country of Kenya is which one? And other than Vision 2030, there's another big four. So in Malawi, do you have a deep, uh, development agenda? 26 very far. Very far will be there. Okay. <laughs> so that is the African Union agenda and other agendas which are set by governments. So as I feel, uh, some of the work that we've been able to provide is to look at the cost of erosion, for example, Tanzania, how you monitor crops, and also how you can even monitor some of the mountains and also uh, water, state, and rangelands. So, in a summary, the data sets that we have are uh, hosted in the Amazon Web Service, or we have an office in Cape Town, where we have over 3 terabytes of data, and provide data for the whole continent. So in this room, even if you're coming from Malawi, Tanzania, anywhere else, the data is there for the whole continent. You can access for free, you can use it to access various algorithms for free, and also we've developed continental services which I'll be able to show you. So for example, the one on the farthest, the, the first one here is a cloud free site uh, called Geomart service. Uh, also we have uh, the water observation from space, which I'll be able to show you some examples, and my colleague will be able to do a demo, and also the best one we have is on cropland for the whole continent. So, in a summary, this data is as follows. We have Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, Landsat-5, 7, 8, and even 9. And we update them as we get them from our providers. So, every week there is an update. And also we have the DEM and Alos Mosaics from JAXA. And I was explaining to uh, my colleague Keshoro that long are the days where we used to download data from the USGS, and I know I used to travel at the lab at JetWatch uh, <laughs> with a, how many did they, that's 2 GB of hard disk. Uh, now at least you guys have a terabyte. So we used to go to the lab to download data, which would take time. Then after that, you get the disappointment that 
it is full of clouds. When I did finish downloading because of the power blackout. Other other frustrations. Strips. Strips. Last strips. Any other frustrations? My colleagues from Decut. Missing scatters or even mixed messages. Or maybe it didn't download because the downloader, the service provider, switch things off. So those, those are the challenges, uh, even having a power blackout and you're not able to proceed with your projects. So all that data for the whole continent is available. Can you imagine? For free. So the other part was that after we downloaded at the various institutions, we have to process using Erdas, Eloise, Idrisi, Kimajaro, Idrisi, Clarke, each other softwares. They're the ones who are the experts. Those ones you've used. So all those have been processed, the data from level one to level two, which means that uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, the trend has really changed. So we had even developing Sentinel one and two around 2014 is when they had the conversations, and around 2014 we had Sentinel one, and Sentinel two we had it around 2016, but now 2017 we have all that data, and also the Sentinel-3 to help with oceanography. So there's a lot of trends coming up, and longer the days that we need to download data. And now the data is in that format. So I'm trying to explain the format is that uh, the space agencies, uh, European Space Agency, as well as the US Geological Service, and other space agencies, uh, JAXA, in the Japanese <coughs> one, they have searched together and established the metadata standards for processing data. So there's level one and level two. So level two is actually ready for use anytime. So we talked about radiometric correction, geometric corrections, all those resources will be corrected. So the data is there to access and it's hosted on a web service, Amazon web service. So the space we used to invest for that server in the lab, is not really important. Now we can invest in the internet and empower our students, researchers, and even the politicians, because now we'll be providing the information that is accurate for them. Instead of them sitting down and saying they're building dams, but we can see from the images what is really happening and empower you as scientists and young entrepreneurs. So one of the products we've developed is a water observation from space, and actually we've developed this based on the needs from the different countries and priorities. So looking at the water observation from space, you can even go at Lake and look at the changes over time, like Victoria, those big bodies that are a challenge, uh, Lake Chad, Central Africa, in Malawi, those lakes, like Malawi, you can look at it any time and see the changes over time. So the water observation from space initially was developed using uh, Landsat 8, it was a seven year project, and we extended that to cover up to 1984, so it means it covers over 30 years, maybe some of you were not around, just an idea. Some of you are born in 85, so we have as data as that much. So you can actually validate that information. So for example, looking at some of the changes, you can see the change over time of our water body, even looking at the as far as Niger Delta. So anywhere you can actually visualize and see the changes of water over time. So that is some of the products. The other one is cropland, which you will have to have an example. Then we also have the cloud-free mosaics, which is available in the products. And also we have the fractional cover. And my colleague has been working with partners in West Africa and East Africa to develop something on coastal erosion. So in case you are from marine sector, you will actually feel empowered. So the platform is free and open, no cost. You can access it as a web service as a map, which any entry level, any user, even a journalist can access, even a politician can be shown. And the other part for analysis, if you just go a little bit GIS analysis, you can be able to register for free on that sandbox. And uh, also we have the program, the data can be accessed through a web service. I know my the young people are able to know those things called API. APIs application programming interface that you can access data from Google in Earth Engine or from Bing Maps or those things you call big data. So you can access it from different platforms without buying any other software. We even have opportunity for you to access the data on your QGIS or AZ software. 
and the partnership with ESG is so strong that they have agreed to put our data on their geo portal so it makes what is available here can also be accessed there. Then freely and uh, lastly you can be able to learn more about the platform in terms of training and it's an online platform, a free course is there, we have a small introduction course where you get a certificate and you're able to share it on your Twitter or even LinkedIn. Uh, even in your CV, you'll become more experienced and add more credentials to your work, but also be able to work smart in the things you do. So you can analyze data now from the sandbox environment. So this enables you to access for free English and French version, not leaving my brother from Burkina Faso. I know I speak very, very small English, small French as well, but uh, we're able to communicate so working closely with our partners, we've been able to translate even the courses in English and French, and we use these uh, libraries to make things a little bit easier. So as a summary, our program is much easier than Google Earth Engine, for those who've used Google Earth Engine. So this one is much more easy. You don't have to have those JavaScript crammed or copy paste. Everything is already, uh, we have algorithms arranged. So to make your life a little bit easier, so these are some of the libraries you've developed, some to help in agriculture, some in water, some in vegetation, land foundation, etc., etc. And I'll be able to share with you the PowerPoint, so don't worry about taking notes. <laughs> so the learning platform, uh, it has been developed through an effort with our partners. Uh, so. Uh, just before COVID, we had the idea of uh, developing the learning materials for free and we had to work with our implementing partners and that way we were able to work virtually and launch the course in August 2020. And so far we've been able to train over 100 people online, uh, the English version, and for the French version we have at least uh, over 35 people who have finished and others have registered and uh, it's just a matter of effort, it's self-paced. You can start today and finish tomorrow, or you can finish after one year, but it's a pace, so you go at your own pace at least so that you can get a certificate and you can be able to use it. So this training course will be able to develop with our partners in English and French, and uh, we are working closely with our implementing partners uh, to develop uh, courses which are fit for purpose. So there's an introduction, there's also a, another section where you can learn much, much more. There's also another one which is now focused on water. We have now another program which we are developing with our partners focused on agriculture. Then also uh, we are looking also at land degradation and just working with the priorities of different countries so that our course will be among the best in the continent to empower everybody so that we leave no country behind out of the 54 or 55 countries. I can leave it to Google. So we also have a help desk as well, so that we're able to support you. Uh, in any case, uh, we get requests on some of the issues you might have, either technical or some information that you require, and also we develop some knowledge base for us to be empowered. So since that time I mentioned August 2020, we've been able to grow our user base from just a few to over 2,000, and these people are connected from everywhere. Uh, we have the training in English and French, and also after the training sessions, we also developed something which is called like a live session every week. So we started this in the August of 2020, and right now we are talking about uh, 97 sessions. So every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Uh, GMT, should be 2 p.m. in East Africa. Uh, we connect with <coughs> users, uh, to share uh, where we are, our impact stories, our experiences, and also showcase some new tools that you've developed, as well as thematic topics that you might require, and you don't have to go to that Google Earth Engine to think so much, just have a session in a YouTube and you can learn. So all the sessions we record them and we put on YouTube for people to discover and search or when you write to me, we can connect and uh, you can be part of our session so that we connect via Zoom. Even if you're connecting from the village or anywhere, uh, you're not left out on the knowledge. So also we continue to grow the user community. Uh, like now we are here, over 30 people. We are learning something new that can help you somewhere or can help even uh, a colleague or some friends in your areas of interest. 
So the sessions that I've talked about in English and French, uh, we started only with English session in 2020, uh, then we were able to get uh, colleagues in Francophone, uh, we started this French session early this year, so we normally alternate uh, this week English, the next week French. So like this week we had uh, Joseph, my colleague, conducted a session in Drought Index yesterday, and we recorded that and uploaded it on YouTube. Uh, next week we'll have a session on uh, English, so it will be about some of the tools that we have for the Africa Geo Portal, working together with ESRI and partners. So we are working with everybody, so it means that we are trying to create impact where it's possible, so that we don't leave anyone behind. Longer the days that you need to use only one tool, you can have variety to compare, so that you can actually be more empowered and do your work quite easy. Uh, so our users have actually grown, uh, having the numbers I was talking about. It was a tough time the last two years because of COVID, but now uh, we thank God for the opportunity even to have this workshop to meet face to face. And we continue to engage with you once we have your contact, uh, we can visit you, or we can actually convene in different uh, mm -hmm. sessions. Like with Geshoro, I know we can convene with the students in JQuart to empower our judges <coughs> at Decute, that's another story. At RCTI, you are the champions, you can work, you have sessions. Other institutions, you can work together. It's Malawi, you can connect. So there are many opportunities for us to connect either virtually or face to face. And also recognizing the opportunities that we have to look at our, our partners as well as work with the young people, uh, diverse communities, we're even working with the Africa women in GIS to empower them so that they can have a voice in the global footprint, in the work they do, they will be able to share. So just going to the impact for the demo so that you can see the value of your participation in this session is that uh, we've worked with the various users, uh, community stakeholders from different countries to come up with some of the stories so that you guys can also be more empowered to actually look at the platform, use it, see the value, where you're coming from, your organization. So looking at different countries, uh, looking at water quality mapping, look at water extent. Uh, we even had a story of uh, relocating giraffes from Lake Baringo because we're rising level of uh, water. Uh, we had a story on the wetlands, uh, different areas. Uh, we have a story on wet, uh, coastal erosion, which is really coming up very well. And the best one is uh, one on mangroves, which uh, I'll be fortunate to play for you a short video so that to just capture your appetite on the program. So, Digital Earth Africa, you can use it in different areas. One of them is crop productivity. Just from the session we had before lunch, you can look at the phenology over different areas, and this is just a sample farm of where Joseph come. This is his farm in Kigali, where he's been farming maize, and uh, you experience the challenges, and you can see the trends in crop productivity using just Sentinel-2 over time, which is very impactful. Then he shared another location of some of the farms around there, and you can actually see the phenology over time, and it's quite impactful that you can see start of a season, end of a season, and this is just algorithms borrowed from some of the scientific community that you can actually uh, put them in the platform and make it easy and your work will just be <coughs> accessing and changing the coordinates here and there to see the value. So there's also the value preposition for water, extent, mapping. Uh, we have just some examples of lake chart, Tanganyika, uh, even looking at Baringo. So there are many water bodies we can look. The tool is there, it's just changing the extent and you'll get the information that will be useful for planning and also for reporting. Uh, this is an opportunity to look at wetlands as part of the GMS work, uh, looking at wetlands. You can look at any wetland in the continent and see and capture even uh, how it's, it appears from space. This can be very impactful for your work because then you can actually see how the scenario has been in the last five, ten years. Very useful. Then also uh, another example of uh, Okavango, which is quite an extent covering from Angola, uh, Namibia, and into Botswana, which most of it is 70%. And from there, you can see the visualization over time of how the basin is changing. It's very impactful. And you can even see the graph on how these changes have been. And in the next slide, you can actually even see a uh, water body, which is just next to the Okavango called Lake Ngami. 
and the change is quite interesting <coughs> captured from space. Uh, looking at this, I was also able to see the story being covered by journalists on Al Jazeera and how this is actually affecting people and we're working with a researcher from Botswana to actually document this and she's been able to develop even a book chapter and she continues to look at more. So we have been empowering those researchers, struggling with the research, you, either you're a student, professor, you're in different sectors, you actually feel more empowered using a tool which you do not really struggle to access, it's free. And we are available, myself, Joseph and the team is here to connect with you anytime, anywhere. So this is an example of what looking at lectured, very big water body, and you can be able to visualize the change over time, and you can see the different colors, where it's red, it's been dry, where it's blue, it's just very little, so it means there's a lot of uh, drought in the area, and you can work to influence policy, or you can even share some of these with your colleagues and researchers, very factual. Even having a screenshot shared beyond an email, you can even share via WhatsApp to a village to empower them. Uh, this is another service which is in development and very soon will be live, cost erosion. Currently you can run the program, but now we want to have it for the full continent and uh, we are working on validation with the implementing partners, including RCMRD to show how we can have this for the whole continent and how we can actually respond to climate change. So what is the use of uh, looking at coastal erosion? So for example, in Mombasa you were sold for a beach plot and uh, the scenario can be different because then you'll be losing your land or gaining. So an erosion means you lose your land or gain, so it's very impactful even for land use planners or planners. Uh, so you can also monitor some snow in the mountains, and this was an example of Renzori, and it's very impactful that it's an index. You can actually see that some areas where there's snow, because this is based on different times because of the climate condition. And one use case which really helps us understand and see the value of Digital Africa for climate change uh, is that uh, we are working with State University of Zanzibar uh, to empower them, the researchers, the academia, uh, the researchers and the academia teach, uh, lecturers teaching their students how to use the platform and the students, part of the youth mappers going on the ground to capture the coordinates. It's quite impactful because we have an ecosystem where the research goes to the ground and we work at the village level with the people to actually validate the results and this was a, quite a story captured last year and documented as part of a climate documentary, which, with your guidance, I can show you a little bit before you doze off. Something in the villages. That's month after maybe 20, 25 years. Zanzibar will disappear. No one's Zanzibar. I don't mind me. Of skills of Earth observation data on how to use geospatial tools to solve the problem that the Earth is facing today. Through these technologies such as Earth observation data, we can have information that show the Earth now and before. Teachers and youth members to actually be able to... That knowledge to instruct others, to teach others, to engage with the groups that to, that to perform the activities to reduce the climate change. And as you know, everywhere now the climate change, climate change is the issues. So I hope that this will be reduced, but the technology is required for it. At State University of Zanzibar, they are training their students, so the students will be the champions. And one day in the future, this student might be the president of Tanzania or somewhere. So we'll be able to use this to make very good informed decisions. In Africa, which says that alone you can move faster. However, as a village, we can actually move further. We join hands and we join our forces in making sure we combat these climate change issues.
platform is just to buy the, the next uh, person to talk about this. Then also we continue to engage also the students, uh, student community. Uh, for example, we are part of the GIS Day uh, celebrations last year. We were at Jomo Kenyatta University. Uh, very grateful to be for the invitation. You see, if we, we are invited, we come. And also we were at Technical University of Kenya as well around the same time. And also the celebration will be November this year. We can connect, see how we can do that possible. Or even beyond that, we can see how we can connect with your institutions and also where to get some of this information. Uh, this slide will also be shared with you. Our website is there, how you can connect with us, the help desk, and the live sessions every uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. East Africa time. And uh, we continue to be engaged with you. And also, I just as I break <coughs> the switch computers, is to thank you for the attention on the theory part. And my colleague will do the live demonstrations that will keep you glued to your seats. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> He will show you how to use the platform and also you can give us an example of an area you want. That village or somewhere, we can see if this thing works. Okay, thank you everyone for being here. So, Kenneth, I said everything. The Africa is here to make life easy. No need to go search for low data. Just access decision the data, run your analysis, get your results, and enjoy your life. So our data could be accessed through different purposes, as I said. The first one, which is the easiest one, everyone could deal with it. It's our D our D Africa maps, which is a kind of web mapping. Through it, you don't need to log on, you don't need to pay any money. Through it, you can see our data set and do some similar analysis, preliminary analysis. And uh, like this is the interface, uh, through it, you can access our data as a kind of show it. So we can explore our data. If we go to Explorer, the thing is this one. Kelly said we have a lot of data on our dashboard, on our server, on AWS, and from through this interface, what you do, you can connect. We have all ready for data dataset from Sentinel images and from Landsat images. And we have also our several annual reflectors. Those are our annual geomads. We have annual geomads from Landsat and annual geomads from Sentinel. What are annual geomads? Those are a kind of mosaic of already processed images and those who are aggregated over a given period, six months, that's semi, semi annual geomat, or a year, those are annual geomat. And we have them uh, for Sentinel 2. Let's test for Sentinel 2, see how it looks like. Uh, internet, the internet allows. Oh, it's taking longer. Let us week, I've been checking. Uh, but no worries, you can get back there. So we have all those Jomad from Landsat and Sentinel. But also, uh, we have surface uh, temperature. Those are data left from our partners, especially. We have also some radar data set. Those are cloud-free cloud data derived mostly from sentinel images. Why cloud-free? Because radar could penetrate clouds, and those are very useful, especially in West African uh, part where there are always clouds in the dense forests. Imagine someone in Cameroon or in DRC 
with a lot of forest cover, even ourselves in the western of Rwanda, with high mountains, we need data that could be crowd free to monitor severe phenomena. So, we have also our uh, famous product. This is what we call water observation from space. As Ken was saying, those products were derived from Landsat 8 and they are freely available via our uh, interface. Let's try if this could be displayed through the network allows. It's taking longer. Okay, no worries. Everyone could try them. So that's, I will show you what you have. Um, we have all other several products. In terms of agriculture, we could have our crop mask that is covering the whole continent, showing cultivated areas, always free available. And we have other data from our partners, like land cover maps that were indexed to our dashboard with the SDI uh, land cover, with the ESCA, that's European Space Agency land cover, and so on. We have meteorological data and the other data sets. All the data could be accessed via our sandbox but also some similar analysis could be done. Let's try to see if we can see, maybe let's use uh, our new job pad uh, uh, for Landsat 8. Here we are, let's say we are in Nairobi. <coughs> see loading. So it this is, it takes longer because we are using our tetra internet. So it's not that strong, but we can do see some changes over time and uh, try to compare what is happening. This is a very simple interface for people who like to explore. Maybe you are a gentleman in the office. You call. You are processing things. You could show your boss immediately. So it's an exploration interface, but. The most important we have to demonstrate to you is our sandbox. Our sandbox is a Python-based interface through which you can run uh, some analysis. So I have tried to open several windows because uh, well, the network was not good. When you open our sandbox, <coughs> it looks like you see there. If someone has internet, you could even write the Africa Sandbox or try to type sandbox dot the Africa dot Africa dot Africa. This that sandbox, what you do when you open it? Do you have internet? No. I'm on internet. Okay. Okay. So it should be a short demo. Okay. When you, when you open our sandbox, it looks like that. So they give you an option. Log in, you log in if you have your account. You sign up if you don't have any account. Right? When you click, this time to work. It works so. Oh, well, very slowly. But when you try to sign in or to log in, they give you a where you could create an account. You have to put your names, uh, your email, and your password. And a, ver a verification email is sent to your inbox. Then you could verify your email and ca can get back and log in. Sometimes it should be it should go to the spam folder. So check the spam folder so that you could confirm the email and start logging in. So, here, you could see, I can sign in because I have an account, but for someone who didn't sign in, you need to sign up. When you go to sign up, a moment, well, this is an important stage. 
they be asking you an email, you put your email, they be, will be asking you to put your name, because they should identify who's who, and also to put a password. And then when you say, sign up, an email is sent to your, your, your inbox. So I want to spend much time here. Let's go to the core business. <coughs> so when, uh, when our sandbox is open, when you, you go already logged in, so you have this type of interface. But the most important for now is this one. D Africa has developed several notebooks called functions, algorithms, and they are already developed and are well grouped in folders <coughs> depending upon what you like to use, what you like to do. The main folders, <coughs> the most important folders, the first one, we have what you call beginner's code. Why do you need beginner's code? Why, why, why those beginner's code? We need beginner's code because we know this is a Python-based interface. To me, that at least you should introduce you to Python to make sure that you will be able to, to run or to modify or to update our existing notebooks or even treat them very easily, very friendly. And this, if you go through this, from how to, to deal with the vector data, how to deal with the tabular data, and how to do some simple analysis in Python, then you have the basics. Secondly, we have, uh, moment. we have also what you call uh, uh, frequently read codes. Those are codes that we think are very important to our data processing and from how to analyze the polygons, how to, uh, how to mask clouds, how to use the pixels. Those are codes that are frequently used during data processing, but also that are frequently used by our, our users. So we have several notebooks. Here we can see we have almost more than 20 notebooks already available. So the other folder here is you could produce some less graphs. This was Lex Runga, I think. And it could show you the spatial temporal evolution of uh, water extent. This was from 2016 uh, to 2021. You see, 2018 was the worst year in terms of water extent. By 20 to 2021, the lake was recovering. And we could produce some nice animations showing how the water was, was uh, increasing or decreasing over years. We can also have some nice graphs. You see from <coughs> 2020 to 2021, the water the lake was more or less stable, while other, other years were created by changes. So all those notebooks are there. You, if you specify the location of another lake, you'll be able to retrieve the same information for location, and then try to say, the water is increasing, we need, inter we need, we need to, to use benefit from it, or to avoid flooding, it is decreasing, we need more intervention. So this was for, even if we can have some other nice graphs comparing years and so on. For the vegetation also, we can study the phenology, see how the vegetation was, uh, was behaving over time in a given area, and we say vegetation is under stress or not, and try to understand the phenology of a given region. People in agriculture, if the, the profile content is decreasing over time, vegetation is under stress, then we need the intervention, the intervention. 
If it is good, then you be good too, and so on. So those codes are already available, and so on. So we can also monitor some urban. This was in the case of Nairobi, and they have an SMAP with a kind of accurate assessment. All those codes are always available. So to to wrap up, it's it's it was to say that. All, all the maps you've seen, Ken is pre, uh, presenting here. All the codes are available via our, our sandbox. You can log on and try to 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 customize them to your region. And we are here to assist you. Always make your life easy. Twenty-four-seven. <laughs> Thank you and be blessed. I could say this. <laughs> so, any comments? What of them? Yes, interested in the area of food security. So we started the conversation with this, but uh, I think time was limiting. So I would just really, when you were presenting, you talked of uh, some of the pillars that you are interested in and you're working on. Food security was one of them. So I just wanted to know, uh, is there a specific area where you guys are working on? Uh, that is A. <coughs> then uh, the second one is, uh, we understand that um, uh, to build, uh, uh, enhance agriculture for the food system, sustainability of farmers, you really need to enhance the, uh, the resilience of farmers to produce. One way that has been uh, confirmed to be perfect in that area is crop insurance. So I just want to know, since you provide EO data, uh, have you provided capacity insurance before? And if you've done that, uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Uh, then the second one is uh, on the same, what solutions or products uh, do you have for crop insurance? So thank you for your question, and I believe you attended the session, so you are given an answer. Uh, we are working with our partner, Samir, who uh, developed uh, a crop insurance, quality assurance project. So our work now is to feed in with the data that we have to their program. So there's no need of reinventing the way we are working with the existing partner, and Arsima is a partner, and Sabir is a partner. And the first question is that uh, we are working with different uh, organizations, for example, we're working with FAO to uh, support the SDG to security using a And as you know from your background, it's not like you can just go to one notebook and get all the answers. So it's a consultative process which uh, for example, my colleague Joseph was giving a training to the National Statistics of Rwanda uh, based on their priorities and food security was one of them. Uh, so first of all, they actually trained to use the program and uh, give us feedback on what they can use because they were saying they were using different programs or scripts, so we don't want to change their ways, just see how we can complement their work. Then also he was working with the Burundi Statistics where they also worked on the agriculture food security and it's ongoing and uh, we are working with the FAO on some of those indicators and it's quite, uh, you can't get just an answer like now because I know maybe if you are reporting from the office of the president it's like the matter figure today, how many hectares, etc, etc. So it's uh, an ongoing conversation and our partners at ESRI have been able to showcase what they were showing in the, uh, before lunch and it's something just we are seeing how we can add value to programs. So actually everyone here is working on a different programs and uh, the opportunity of this workshop is to appreciate what is there and how it can connect with us 
and also how we can work with you to improve the service and dialogue. For example, Dr. Jane comes from Italy in Uganda, and she's part of the GMAs working on wetlands. Is there anything, is there anything you are working on the food security? Rangelands. in the northern of uh, Uganda. In the west. Okay. EU project. Okay. So what I was trying to say to my brother is that there are different programs, different uh, opportunities to connect to come up with a solution, and we cannot say today we'll have the solution for this one. For example, the water extent has taken us at least two years to at least one year validation, and uh, we still continue to work with partners to improve it. And uh, the feedback we get from everybody is very important for us to work and even how we can package the tool for policy maker or for someone from a research organization. And for example, the project I mentioned with Azarek, I is trying to see how we can strengthen the agriculture and water nexus. Some of this work is, I think a dialogue is what is required first, and then uh, we can connect pieces. Our statistics officers are using different programs. For example, that one in Rwanda, they're using R, Joseph? R statistics. Yes. Yeah. So try to bring them to these notebook environments as you can see, it's quite something else. Then I have my colleagues who are using Mobile Lab Engine for their work, and we're in the same room, and we're not fighting, we're just collaborating. So it's, a, <laughs> it's a, quite a dialogue. My brother in the water sector, he might want answers today. It's something we can work together to develop. So we can also look at our expectations, how we can manage them, but uh, work together with everybody as a team. What of them? OK, so question? We had a case study survey in Maral, which we did and did a report, and right now we are doing a survey in Zambia. We've already started a case study survey for monitoring for Amiwom, if you have the infestation and all that. And we now have, we are already getting in uh, uh, the data, but I was kind of asking about that the secondary data we get from the data you have to complement on our research. Okay. So thank you for your question. Yes. Just, just before lunch, we had a presentation with my colleague Julius Bioko from RCMD. So they are using our platform as part of our work and partnership with FAO. Uh, we are looking at crop type model in Zambia. So they are already in Zambia and I think uh, we are able to connect with them or you can connect with me and you can see how you can connect. Yes, so you see everyone has somewhere where you can connect and uh, this is the workshop. The moment that I wish it could be twice a year, so it can learn much more. Yes. What about this question? Yes. Okay, so, what about this? Ah. Yes. 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 Thank you so much and welcome to the closing session.